time to talk about the basics of tank armor. After all, we want to know the basics when we're diving into tank designs in upcoming videos. Note that this video is limited in scope and mostly deals with the development of the interwar period up to the 1980s. Anyway, let's get started with armor materials. The usual material for armor was and is steel. But there are different techniques of producing steel and also other materials. Let's take a look. Rolled homogeneous steel armor was for quite some time the standard steel armor for tanks. Rolled steel means that the hot steel was rolled for one or several pairs of rolls. It can be easily produced in large quantities, but can only be bent to a limited degree. Usually it is used for armor plates. Germany in World War II used for the most part rolled armor. Thus the tank cars and turrets have boxy features. In contrast, the cast steel turret for the Sherman had round features. Now a few words about the terminology. Rolled steel plates are usually welded together. Hence the term welded armor is usually used instead of rolled armor. Although this can be a bit misleading since cast armor is also welded together unless the part is completely cast. Thus cast turret or hull implies that large parts of the elements are made from cast steel. Now the other main method for producing tank armor is steel casting. In this case the liquid hot metal is poured into a mold. This has a main advantage, because the armor can be molded into various shapes easily, allowing for curved areas and specific thicknesses. Initially this technique was rather rare, but it was already used in World War I for several versions of the French Renault FT tank turret. In World War II the British, Soviets and US used various cast turrets. But it isn't so straightforward. For example the Churchill Mark III had a welded turret, whereas the Mark IV had a cast turret. And for certain variations of the T-34 there exist both welded and cast turrets. As you can see it can get quite complicated. Even up to this day certain tanks have some variants with cast and welded turrets like the T-90. But back to World War II. In general, the Allies used more cast turrets than the Germans as the war progressed. After the Second World War, cast turrets became almost universal for main battle tank turrets. Since the 1950s, it is also common to cast complete hulls. Nevertheless, as mentioned before, even current tank models use also welded elements. Now let's take a look at the advantages and disadvantages. The disadvantages of cast armor is that heat treatment and other refining techniques are complicated or not possible. Thus it is not as tough and shock resistant as rolled armor. A manual from the US Army Material Command from 1963 states. In general rolled armor is about 15% better in resistance to shock and penetration than cast armor. However this advantage is offset to some extent by the varying angles of obliquity and irregular shapes possible in castings. These variations in shape considerably decrease the penetrating ability of certain types of projectiles. Note that I don't know if this value is also correct for World War II steel or current steel. Now one way to improve the hardness of armor was to process the surface of the armor. This process creates face hardened homogeneous steel armor. In this process called carburizing the armor is heated in a furnace for a considerable amount of time. Usually rolled armor plates were used for this. The advantage is to increase the hardness, thus increasing the chance that projectiles shatter on impact. But increased hardness also increases the brittleness. Additionally the welding of such armor plates could often lead to cracking during welding or afterwards. Furthermore the process is quite expensive and not suited for mass production. During the 1960s the problem of cracking could be overcome and high harness armor was used on light armored vehicles mostly. Only in the 1980s the technology was suitable to produce dual hardness steel thick enough for main battle tanks. There were also various non-iron based armors like titanium, aluminium, magnesium alloys, nylon, fiberglass and others. Probably one of the most notable non-iron armored vehicles is the armored personnel carrier M. 113, which has aluminium armor and is also one of the most produced armored vehicles outside of the Soviet Union. Also other aluminium armored vehicles were built like the M114, M108 and M109. Although aluminium is lighter, for the same amount of protection about three times the thickness is needed 
compared to rolled steel. There are various advantages and disadvantages for aluminium. As pointed out by the author Ogur Givic. In addition to savings in weight, aluminium armor is also easier to machine and greater thickness of its plates makes it possible to use step joints, which provide a partial interlock between plates and require therefore less welding. All this has helped to reduce the cost of producing vehicles with aluminium armor, but its cost per ton has been significantly higher than that of rolled homogeneous armor. There are various armored vehicles that use aluminium and or aluminium alloys to a large degree, like the M551 Sheridan, the British Alvis Scorpion, French AMX-10, and also the M2 Bradley infantry fighting vehicle. Now the Bradley also has a composite armor, so let's take a look at it. The wide adoption of shaped or hollow charges like the Panzerfaust, RPG and heat shells allowed the penetration of thick monolithic steel armor quite easily. This led to the development of composite armor. To spare you and me some complicated math here, basically hollow charges are not too much affected by the density of the material. Thus, certain lower density materials provide better protection for their mass in comparison to steel. Hence the term for this is also called mass effectiveness, which almost sounds like a really cheesy title for a computer game. The problem is that the resulting thickness usually makes those materials impractical to protect against shaped charges. Furthermore, they are also quite useless against regular anti-tank ammo, or to use the technical term kinetic energy projectiles. Yet the combination of low and high density materials can provide effective armor protection. The US started to develop composite armor at the end of the Second World War. There were firing tests with Shermans. Later on different versions of composite armor were developed for the M48 and M60 patent, but didn't see mass production due to cost and difficulty in production. Yet the British developed the so-called Jobham armor, which was also used by the US and Germany in the design since the early 1970s. Since then, almost all new battle tanks have been built with some form of composite or multi-layered armor instead of monolithic steel armor. There are various materials like glass, ceramic and aluminum oxide that offer greater protection against shape charges than the density might suggest. Yet those materials often have the disadvantages. The most effective approach is to use multi-layered armor consisting of steel and set materials. The effectiveness can also be improved by spacing those layers although this makes the armor more bulky. Another protection against shape charges is explosive reactive armor. It was developed in the 1970s and was first used by the Israelis in their operations in 1982 in Lebanon, with British Centurions and US M60s. A few years later the Soviet T-64 and other Soviet tanks were also equipped with reactive armor. Now to properly explain reactive armor we need some basic understanding of shape charges. To put it very simply, a shape charge creates a jet of molten metal that burns through armor. Reactive armor solves this problem by exploding when it gets hit. Of course, it's a bit more complicated than that. Reactive armor is basically a hollow brick, consisting of an explosive charge between two metal plates. Now if the brick is penetrated by a shaped charge, the explosive goes off and the brick expands towards the shaped charge. There are two effects that reduce the effectiveness of the shaped charge. First, its velocity and angle is changed and second, the expansion of the plates requires the molten jet to go through more space. Of course, reactive armor must be designed resistant enough to be unaffected by artillery fragments and small arms fire. Also, it can be a potential hazard to unbuttoned crew and nearby supporting infantry. Now, before we look at the ballistic properties, let's take a look at the physical properties because those are determining the ballistic ones. And the most important physical properties are a. Hardness, the ability of armor to resist indentation b. Toughness, the ability of armor to absorb energy before fracturing c. Soundness, the absence of local flaws, cavities or weaknesses in the armor Unsoundness is not so often found in rolled armor as in cast armor because of the mechanical working which has been done during the hot rolling process. Note that a high hardness, which is measured by the Brunel hardness number, usually makes armor quite brittle and easier to break, thus reducing the toughness rating. Thus increasing one value can also lead to a reduction of another value. Hence the proper balance is more important than one local maximum. 
So let's move on to the ballistic properties that are most important for armor. The necessary ballistic properties which are required of armor consist of resistance to penetration, resistance to shock and resistance to spalling. Resistance to penetration is quite simple. It is the ability of the armor to resist partial or complete penetration. Next is the resistance to shock, which means the ability of the armor to absorb energy without cracking or rupturing. Note that resistance to shock is referring to energy, thus it includes both projectiles as also explosions. Also atmospheric conditions can change this property. Low temperature makes most materials more brittle and thus more likely to crack. Something you should consider, especially if you want to invade Russia, Canada or Finland. Finally, resistance to spalling, which is the property of armor resisting to partial cracking, flaking and breaking away of smaller elements. Especially on the opposite side of the penetration, usually spalling results in an expanding hole from the entry to the exit of the armor plate. Or to put it another way, resistance to spalling is the property of your armor plates preventing themselves from transforming into a shotgun blast that turns your crew into Swiss cheese. Now while reading I encountered a very interesting distinction. It seems that most of us use the term penetration not quite precisely. To quote, the term penetration is reserved for the entry of a missile into armor without passing through it. The term perforation implies the passage of the missile completely through the armor. Now if one thinks in more biological terms, this actually makes quite a lot of sense. But in case you want to go full penetration perforation Nazi, here's a list of subreddits that will really enjoy your comments, whereas the word enjoy is used rather loosely here. Next, the overall surface design of tank armor should be focused on providing appropriate protection in relation to the expected direction of attack. For instance, strong frontal armor and weak rear armor. Furthermore, the tank should have an overall convex surface. And as a short reminder, this is what a concave looks like. In context with armor design, convex is reached by the absence of re-entrant angles. These so-called shot traps would often occur between the turret and the hull. What makes them so dangerous is that the deflected projectiles could strike weak spots in the armor that were usually hard to hit, like the top of the hull. Probably the best known shot trap of World War II is the early Panther. As you can see here, a shot that bounces from the gun mantlet will deflect into the upper side of the hull, which is weakly armored. This was the reason why the gun mantlet was changed. As you can see here, the lower pant is a later variant. Here the same shot will not be directed towards the hull if it ricochets. Re-entrant angles are also relevant when attacked by high explosive shells, because they will also redirect the explosive blasts and fragments into the lesser protected areas. Now, another aspect that is less obvious is that the surface should be as regular as possible. Basically, every irregularity that breaks the uniformity of the armor will restrict the uniform absorption of energy and as a result could damage the armor. Thus, a flat, smooth wall of constant thickness offers the best resistance to severe attack, principally because the shock of impact can be uniformly absorbed over the entire area. Probably one of the best known armor features is sloped armor, which is one of the features the Russian T-34 is well known for. Sloped armor is basically armor that is not angled at 90 degree. Sloped armor increases the effectiveness of armor in two ways. First, it increases the distance the projectile has to perforate. In this case, an armor of the thickness of 1.2 has an effective armor thickness of 1.7 if it's angled at 45 degree. And secondly, due to the angle deflections and shattering of projects becomes more likely. Another way to improve the armor is by using spaced armor. One of the first tanks that was fitted with spaced armor was the late Panzer III in 1942. After the Second World War, spaced armor was not used commonly until the 1960s. Yet nowadays spaced armor is not so obvious than in World War II. For instance, the Leopard 2A5 uses spaced armor at the frontal part of the turret. Probably the best known use of spaced armor was the German Schürzen or armor skirts in World War II. These were originally introduced to protect the sides of German armored vehicles against Soviet anti-tank rifles that fired conventional kinetic rounds. Why do I mention that? 
because there's an ongoing myth out there that the skirts were introduced to protect against shape charges. Yet at the time of the introduction of armor skirts in 1943, shape charges weren't common on the battlefield yet. Armor skirts were not common the first decades after the Second World War, but they were reintroduced with the British Centurion and other tanks in the 1960s and 70s, although this time in order to protect against shape charges. There were also other forms of spaced armor, namely sled, cage or bar armor, which was also used in World War II, with wire meshes instead of metal plates for the skirts. It usually consists of steel bars that are located at certain distances to the main armor of the vehicle. After World War II, sled armor saw a reintroduction in the 1960s and recently it was used by the Israelis and US troops in the Middle East to protect against shape charges. Also, since it is relatively easy to produce, Vehicles used in the current conflicts in Iraq and Syria are equipped with all kinds of sled and chain armor. For some interesting pictures, you might check out the galleries the blog Tank and Armored Fighting Vehicle News put up. As always, the link is in the description. As a final remark, one important aspect that we need to consider when it comes to armor is the feasibility in terms of industry, cost and resources which is probably very well expressed with this remark from 1963. The alloys of certain light metals show future promise for use as aircraft armor, where the importance of weight saved would offset the disadvantages of substituting a more expensive, strategically critical material in place of steel. To summarize, steel was and is a common material for armoring tanks. Once it was used almost exclusively, it has a high density and is quite easily to produce in large quantities. The introduction of shape charges, although allowed to penetrate even very thick steel plates easily. To counter shape charges, various measures were introduced, like spaced, composite and explosive reactive armor. Thus nowadays a tank is usually armored with multiple layers of different materials and or additional armors, like spaced and reactive armor. Although steel was the main material for main battle tanks, for light armored vehicles, aluminum alloy is not uncommon since the 1960s. Armor design is a complex topic because many factors affect each other. For instance, the key physical properties of tank armor are hardness, toughness and soundness, whereas increased hardness usually decreases toughness. Furthermore, certain materials and techniques are quite expensive. Thus armor design is not only influenced by military and engineering aspects, but also by the feasibility in terms of industrial capabilities and resources of the producing country. Thank you for watching. Please like, comment, share and subscribe. And see you next time.